literacy. We are going to take a look at lesson four seven, the end of the course, mixed equations. So this is a review of most of the equations that we've seen this term. There are a few things that are a little more complicated than this, but the basic types of equations that we've come across. are linear. That's where we have a constant rate of change. Stuff that looks like y equals something times x plus some other number. Example of this, suppose I have a car that when it's new is worth $30,000. and that it will depreciate by a constant amount. Oops. So instead of a percentage per year like we looked at before, we also looked at a constant amount. So let's suppose it's going to drop by $1,500 per year. And this $1,500 per year, that's a rate, and technically it's called a rate change for the situation. And rate of change is another phrase that means slope. And that is what the M refers to here. So I have a change in dollar amount divided by a change in time. And the B always represents our starting amounts. And sometimes linear equations increase, sometimes like this one, they decrease. So for this one right here, uh, if I wrote it in terms of Y, my slope is a negative 1500 times X plus the starting amount, 30,000. It's always a good idea to state what each variable means. So in this case, y is the value of the car. And x would be time in years. That's an example of a linear equation. We've seen things like that before. And let's try another one. Another popular equation that we've seen would be exponential. The basic type of exponential that we came across is something like y equals a times b to the power of x. So an example of something like this, consider problem number five in our worksheet. Lesson four, seven. Number five. That up a little. So coral reefs are dying at approximately 10% per year, writing an equation that can be used to determine the future size of a coral reef that has an area of 1,000 kilometers squared. Of course, our exponential. Exponential equations have some starting amount times some repeated multiple over time, usually. Uh, so suppose, like in problem number five, the coral reef problem, that we have a coral reef is dying at approximately 10% per year. And so uh, as the coral reef dies, it decreases in, in the area. And so if it started at uh, 100 uh, kilometers squared, then here we can demonstrate uh, how much we're losing. Now, in this case, since I, I, I have uh, how much I'm losing per year, I have to keep in mind how much I keep, what's left of the coral reef. And so to do that, I have to think with respect to 100%. So we're losing 10% per year. You always start with 100%. Losing the 10% means we retain 90%. So as a decimal, that would be 
So in this case, starting with 100, we're going to lose 90% per year. And so repeated multiples of 0.9 give us an exponential equation here. And so this equation would give us the area of the reef over time. All right, another example. Other types of equations that we've dealt with are quadratic. An example of quadratic equation is anything involving area <clears throat> has two things multiplied. So feet times feet is square feet, or maybe meters squared, miles squared, kilometers squared. Uh, area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. Area of a square is pi is just the side length squared. Sometimes we jump into a higher dimension than the second dimension. Three dimensions, a cube is the side length cubed. Or a sphere would be four-thirds pi r cubed. So uh, the second power is called a quadratic. Third power is called a cubic. These are examples of power functions or polynomials. So here's an example of an area function in action. Consider the picture of me right here. If we were to change the length but not the width, then that would distort the image. Okay, so instead of having a circular head, I would have a, 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 long, a tall uh, oval type head. If we needed to say take 25% of the width, we'd also have to take 25% of the length. Uh, so taking 25% of the length times 25% of the width, if we clean that up, 0.25 times 0.25, I think is 0 0.0625. Let me ask the calculator. 0 0.25 times 0.25 is, yeah, 0 0.0625. So this is about, actually it's exactly equal to 0 0.0625 times the length times the width. Now keep in mind, length times width is area. So what happens is when we take 25% of each dimension, the length and the width, what we're going to end up with, now that's, uh, keep in mind with fractions, I have, what, well, oops, 1 quarter times 1 quarter which makes this 1 16. We'll see that in just a moment. So I end up with uh, a new area that's equal to 1 16th of the old area. And so this ends up giving me a quadratic equation. Oh, here it is going to make the R today. Let's get rid of that. <clears throat> the 1 16th came from 1 4th times 1 4th. So essentially what I have there is 1 4th squared times, oops, times the old area. And the 1 4th came from the amount I tried to decrease my width by. And if I want to keep the length proportional, I have to do the same thing there. So what we have is a new equation here. So the new area can be found if we have a proportional image, and that extra R again, by whatever the fraction reduction is. Let's call that uh, F. We're taking some fraction of the length. If we square that, because we have to take the same fraction of the width, and we multiply by that by the old area. So this is a quadratic equation relating uh, resizing an image. And it works if you try to make the image bigger also. And so if we look back at this image right here, and I tried to take uh, one-fourth of this image, so this length right here is about one-fourth, I would also have to take one-fourth of the width here. And that would be about this chunk here. So my new image should be this big right there. And if you think about it, I've broken this into a four by four grid. Each little rectangle is the same proportions of the big rectangle. And there's 16 of them 
little ones and the big ones. So this little one is definitely one sixteenth of the big one. Okay. So we have to square our uh, reducing or multiplying factor in order to compare length to area. And that's a classic example of working with a power function, or in this case, quadratic. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we're going to get a little bit more complicated. Consider the equation of the volume of a sphere, and that's 4 pi over 3 times the radius cubed. We're going to jump into one of the last problems in this section. to it, which relates to volume and densities. This is some pretty cool stuff. Almost there. I'm playing around with these other problems on another day. Okay, so like considering a hot air balloon. Uh, so the air or gas we put into a balloon is going to be, if it's lighter than uh, the air around it, it will float. Right? Similar thing happens with buoyancy in water. Uh, and so to figure that out, we need to consider a density of an object. Density is mass, how much material is crammed into a given volume. So for example, consider a ball of wood versus a ball of, of metal, and both are solid. There's more material packed, dense, tight into the metal, and then the wood has more space on the inside of it. And so uh, the metal has a higher density than the wood. Uh, so we have this relationship here that density is equal to mass over volume. So we're going to play around with that a little bit on paper and on a spreadsheet. So some things that are going to be important to us here, this equation, density equals mass over volume. Uh, that water has a density of about one gram per cubic centimeter. That, uh, let's see, where's the other one? That steel has a density of about eight grams per cubic centimeter. And we're going to take a look at some balls, a solid one and a hollow one, both made up of 100 grams of material. And grams are a measure of mass, not a measure of weight. So for example, one of these balls with 100 grams of metal uh, has the same 100 grams whether it's on Earth or on the Moon. However, it will weigh different in each spot. Okay. Kilograms are also a measure of mass, not weight. So for example, uh, let's say I weigh uh, 80 kilograms on Earth, I will also weigh 80 kilograms on the Moon. Uh, I'm, I'm misspeaking here, actually, because I said weigh. Uh, it's actually mass, not weight. Weight considers gravity, and gravity of the Moon is different than gravity of the Earth. It's a whole other discussion. Let's get back to density uh, and mass. We're going to answer some of these questions here, and then we're going to take a look at this table. Uh, and this next relationship between the volume of a sphere uh, and the radius with mass and density involved. Okay, so let's do it. So things that we need to consider here are the volume of a sphere. Uh, we also need to consider that uh, density is equal to mass divided by volume. So how much stuff divided by the space you put it in gives you how dense it is. We can write this mass density volume equation in different ways. Uh, for example, we could multiply the volume to the left, divide the density to the right, and so we get an equivalent equation that says volume is equal to mass over density. Uh, and an alternative version of that would be to isolate mass, multiplying density to the other side, or volume, vice versa. And then we get that mass is equal to density times volume. So those are the three versions of that equation that can come in handy here. Uh, the first question we are asked to consider, what happens to the density, density 
question mark as the volume increases. So we let the volume go up. So that would be like blowing up a balloon, right? Um, and here, something to consider is that to do this, the mass is going to be held constant. Mass is constant. So for example, with the ball example, so we start with a solid ball of 100 grams. And then we melt it down and we make it into a, we cast it into a hollow sphere. That sphere will be bigger because there's empty space inside. Okay, so we made the volume bigger. But what's going to happen with the density? So remember that density is equal to mass over volume. And let's consider a simple example where the mass is 1. If the volume was 1, the density is 1. If we take that same mass of 1 and we make it twice the volume, uh, notice then the density becomes 1 half, right? Mass over volume. Or, oops, not equals, just another example. Or if we kept the mass fixed at 1 and we made the volume 3 times bigger, notice as the volume increases, so I'm increasing the volume here, the density in this case is the whole fraction, and the fraction is decreasing. So that tells me that density decreases as volume increases. So density, the fraction, decreases. Right? And that makes sense. If you put a bigger denominator in the fraction, the whole thing is smaller. Right? Think of a slice, uh, think of a pizza. Cut the pizza in half, you get a big slice. You cut it into eighths and you get a little bitty slice. Okay. So more slices, less. Uh, each piece is smaller. And that's what this represents here. So that's 735. Uh, we want to use the density formula to uh, determine the volume of the steel ball. Um, so let's see. What do we know for this next part? So question number 36. We know that density is equal to mass over volume. And so we're given earlier that the density of steel is 8 grams per cubic centimeter. So that's my density. And the mass that we're given with is 100 grams of steel to work with. And we need to figure out the volume. So here we could consider a little cross multiplying and dividing. So we're going to get V times 8 grams is equal to 100 grams times centimeters cubed. And then we want to get the volume alone, so we'll divide the 8 grams over. So volume in this case is 100 grams divided by 8 grams times centimeter cubed. And I kept the units in here just to demonstrate that the grams will divide out, leaving centimeters cubed, which is a unit of volume. And so let's see, how many times does 8 go into 100? Let's see, we cut it in half once, so we get 50, then 25, then 12.5. So what I get is 12.5 centimeters cubed is the volume of my solid steel ball. Uh, next, to figure out what the radius of that ball is, so this will be the smaller version of the ball, we'll have to take our equation for the volume of a sphere, which is 4 pi over 3 times the radius cubed, set that equal to our volume, and solve for the radius. 
So to solve here, um, I can multiply by the reciprocal of this fraction. So that's going to give me that r cubed is equal to 3 over 4 pi times that 12.5, which we can rewrite if you think about this as multiplying two fractions. That's 3 times 12.5 divided by 4 times pi. And we get the r alone, we learned about a cube root or the one-third power. So r on its own is going to be equal to that fraction, 3 times 12.5. I'm going to wait to put this in my calculator, all raised to the power one-third, because the power one-third undoes the power of three. So I'm going to enter that into my Google calculator and see what I get. I have to be careful with parentheses. Google. Let's just type two plus two, bring up the calculator. All right, so we have clear parentheses. 3 times 12.5. That one's okay. The denominator is complicated, so when I divide, I have to put the denominator in parentheses and write it as 4 times pi. All right, close the denominator, close the fraction, and then raise it to the power, parentheses. I'm tired of just died. Parentheses, where is it? Uh, one over three. Ah, oh, tablet's dead. Bummer. Okay, so I get about 1.439. And my writing tool, my tablet, just bit the bullet. The charger apparently isn't working. So, uh, we just calculated the radius of a steel ball that has a volume of 12.5 centimeters. All right, so I'm going to have to switch over to a spreadsheet to finish this up. So that was number 37, the 1.4397. And that's uh, measured in centimeters because we took the cube root of centimeters cubed. Okay, what we're going to do next is in a spreadsheet, we're going to build this table and these graphs. And then I'm going to have to come back to the rest of this on another recording because I have nothing to write on moment. So spreadsheet. So I started building this uh, right here. Some things to note. Uh, what do we have? We have a um, initial volume. Volume, oh, can't volume, let's call it zero, is 12.5. Centimeters cubed, and that gave us an initial radius zero radius of about. So I can calculate it here just to double check. Equals. Where were we? we were three times twelve point five divided by parentheses four times pi, which needs a little parentheses on it itself. The whole thing is raised to the power of one third in parentheses, and that should give me why one point four four ish. So over here, I made some calculations, and let's see if I did them right. So here I'm assuming the radius is 1.5, which is just a little bigger than what I have, 2, 2.5, and 3. The volume of a sphere is 4 pi, this is how you enter pi on a spreadsheet, divided by 3 times the radius, which is located in column A, cubed. So here I just typed in that formula, hit enter, and then filled it down. So that gives me the volumes of balls that have radius 1.5 centimeters, 2 centimeters, 2.5, 3, and 3.5. To calculate 
density, we take our mass and divide by volume. And so the mass, we're fixed. We only have 100 grams of steel to work with. So as the volume gets bigger, we have a, a, a bigger hollow core, uh, we should see the density drops, and we can see that here. So I just took for density, I said I set it equal to my mass, 100, divided by my volume, which is changing with the size of the wall. And then I fill that down. So I can see here, as volume increases, density drops, which is what we predicted earlier when we were messing around. Uh, looking at the graphs of these, so if I ask the computer to graph radius versus volume, I get this graph here, and I can see as the radius increases, the volume increases. And if you put a, a line to that, you'll see they don't quite line up or straight edge to that. Okay. This is curving upward. Alternatively, if we take a look at the radius, and to, set, to, to highlight two separate things, you hold after your first selection, let go of the mouse, hold control, highlight your second selection. And then I can create a new chart. And that screen is too big. Shrink it down. And I scroll through until I see my scatter plot. So I can see radius versus density. So as the radius increases, the density uh, drops. So I have radius going this way and density going that way. We labeled that here, radius versus density. So we can see small radius, high density. If we have a big radius, we have a low density because we're keeping the same amount of material. It's kind of like blowing up a balloon, but ours is made of steel. And then the last graph I made was volume versus density. And that's right here. And so as the volume increases, we can see the density dropping. And notice it does not do so in a straight line. It's not exponential either. It's a different kind of function, a cube root function. All right. So I'm going to stop this here. If I haven't edited the video by now, then you, there's a little part uh, about a quarter of the way in where I'm talking and you can't see my screen, which I, I remedy shortly after. I'll catch you all soon. Have a good day. Hello. Shadowy. Goodbye.